Greece is portrayed as an idealized, impassioned woman dressed in white, reminiscent of David's central figure in the Sabine women. She rises heroically above the rubble, arms extended, appealing for help in the cause of liberty. And so the electrifying effects of the Napoleonic era, creative and destructive, left their mark on artists as well as on everybody else. The neoclassical style would continue into the 19th century, but arid and academic, incapable of imparting true feeling. And true feeling is at the core of the sensibility which followed the revolution, the period we know now as the age of romanticism. There's no real definition of romanticism, we think perhaps of wild-eyed artists and poets like Keats and Shelley, of melancholy Gothic ruins and mysterious northern landscapes where 19th century men communed with nature. And all that is a part of it. But the poet Baudelaire said that the key to romanticism was not the subject matter or even truth itself, but feeling that you should listen to that inner voice, and that alone would give art its merit. And so the old moralities which had driven art in the past, religion, uh, traditional ethics, uh, civic virtues, and so on, were thrown out of the window. Even reason itself was seen to be insufficient. All that counted was feeling and experience. This new sensibility, uh, heroic and sentimental, self-assertive, and profoundly individualist would lie at the center of Western art from that time until the present day. France, like the rest of Europe, was now changing fast. A rapid rise in population, the spread of industry, a shift from country to city, and the emergence of an urban proletariat helped bring about the growth of new social structures, and with them, political conflicts, the printing press was now enabling millions to receive new ideas in a time of growing turmoil. And it was in a newspaper, perhaps La Gazette, that Jericho read the horrifying account of the tragedy of the Medusa. In the summer of 1816, the French frigate, the Medusa, carrying soldiers and passengers, was wrecked off the African coast. The captain, of noble birth and a political appointment, was proved incompetent. Of the 115 men and women who tried to save themselves on a makeshift raft, only 15 survived. 13 days on a floating coffin, human beings reduced to a state of animal despair, a poignant human drama of corpses and victims who suffered atrociously but for no noble cause. Above, on the apex of the human pyramid, men and women gesturing frantically. This painting came to be regarded as a political allegory of a deeper sort. The French historian Michelet wrote, France herself, our whole society, is on that raft. clouds of revolution were gathering again. At 
the end of July 1830, Paris was up in arms. It was the end of the Bourbons, the ruling family of France for so many centuries. Everyone hoped in liberty and in freedom. It was a great moment of French history. Delacroix was not at all a radical, politically speaking. speaking. He was a quite famous artist at this moment of his life, and he immediately understood that it was for him the occasion to paint a great picture. And he painted a very great picture. It's, of course, a political picture. It is also a history picture. By history, I mean it's an allegory, an allegory of freedom. And the lady in the middle of the picture, the woman in the middle of the picture, represents freedom and liberty. She has in her hand the French flag, the three colors of France, and she is dominating the picture where you see a lot of people, dead soldiers, workers, an intellectual wearing a hat. All these figures are taken in everyday life. The figure of Liberty herself is wearing a slipped dress, barefooted like a Greek goddess. This woman of the people is no longer simply cast in antique language, as were the Sabine women. She is an ardent, vital, bare-breasted vision, brandishing a flintlock and waving her country's new flag. A woman of the people wearing the Phrygian cap, the red bonnet, she has now become a universal symbol of revolution. And finally, of course, the figure of the French Republic itself. Ironically, Delacroix's liberty was bought by the liberal king, Louis Philippe, who never dared show it. It wasn't publicly exhibited until 1861. Two years afterwards, a distant ancestor of Delacroix's allegorical figure arrived in Paris, the winged victory of Samothrace. It was sculpted in ancient Greece in about 200 BC. Like liberty, Victory is portrayed as female, inspiring, alluring even, as she alights gently on the prow of a victorious warship, the wind streaming against her body. It's a theme which turns up in many forms in the story of Western art. Like liberty, victory is a beguiling, idealized personification of an abstraction for which men and women have been prepared to die. In the 18th century, the Age of Reason used symbols like this in the belief that the humane values of classical tradition could be attained even today. The revolution hung on to such symbols, both to express their high hopes and in the end to justify their worst excesses. And of course, these are still potent myths in our culture today. In the story of Western art, though, by the middle of the 19th century, changes in the air Artists begin increasingly to be interested in portraying modern life, and they will turn their back on the classical tradition. <laughs>